Welcome to our Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes and today I am absolutely delighted to be joined by Tony Haggerty and Amy Canavan on this Monday afternoon. Uh, there was a wee delay there because it looks as though we aren't going live on Facebook for some reason. That is a technical glitch. We are live on LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitch and Twitter. Amy, I'm going to come to you first. And I'm going to ask you the question because you have inside information on the league. We done a, a watch along yesterday uh, with the B team, and um, pretty impressed. I eh? some really good performances. I felt so. You can tell us where are Celtic faring across the board this season because you, of course, are part of the media team at Bonnie Rig Rose. So you've seen a lot of the teams involved. In fact, you've seen them all. Um, your outfit are pretty impressive yourself. What's the story with Celtic? Um, and let's tie it into the new signing um, as well of Johnny Kenny. I'm looking at that as a Celtic fan thinking, if we're investing in that team, <clears throat> we're looking at us being in that league or in the league pyramid long term. Would you take anything from that, do you think? I think you're spot on. Um, I would certainly agree, agree with that. I don't have any inside information if Celtic are prolonging their, their stay in the Lowland League or whatnot. There hasn't been, well, certainly not to my knowledge yet, any kind of formal discussions. Um, but as you say, Bonnerig are kind of flying high. So I'll be honest, I'm not really too fussed because I'm hoping that, that we'll get, we'll certainly win the league and then obviously it'll be up against Highland League uh, if promotion then does um, does follow suit. But yeah, you're looking at Johnny Kenny we were just speaking about before we came on there. That's a five-year deal. That's a long contract. So to yeah. me, as not nothing to do with Bonn Rose, just as a Celtic fan, that suggests to me, right, he's walking into Tommy McIntyre's side. Not necessarily walking in, but he's walking into that setup, um, and he's going to be applying his trade kind of there and then make that, we hope will soon become like almost a natural progression just into into Postacoglu's first team side. But Celtic B, they are, they're doing okay. A few weeks ago, I said that they weren't actually that impressive. Um, but they had a few games in hand and they've kind of, they've picked things up a little bit. The way that I just don't think they're quite as impressive is they don't, you know, wipe, wipe uh, the, the floor with sides in the same way that Rangers Rangers B do. You know, that you'll see a lot more four fives fr from the Rangers side. Yeah. Things Celtic yesterday um, were extremely impressive, really quite compact performance, probably one of the best performances I've seen, given that there was a lot of rotation in, in the Celtic side. Um, but for me, it's just, you know, Cali Braves, Bonnig played them on um, Boxing Day as well, and you touched on it, I tell you that, kit, Cali Braves kit is even worse in real life, it's absolutely disgusting. I thought it's, you were going to say that famous, it's honking. That they uh, said well, on that the, the Celtic terrible. video we put out the other week, yeah. Nine hundred and ninety nine colours <laughs> on it. It's I don't know what it is. I think Kevin Graham said it's like the the carpet on a club in the nineties, and I'd probably agree. But um, no, Cali Braves and everything that you guys said in your analysis were were absolutely spot on. You know, they are a team. They were called Edu Sport Academy. There's a lot of, you know, Motherwell Academy players who have fell through, never quite made it. So. There are a lot of young, talented guys who've all came from different, basically different um, first team academies. So they are kind of fresh. There's a lot of money invested in them, though, at Cali Braves, um, mm. albeit not really where they play. They play at Alliance Park in Motherwell, which is like right beside m and and it's just the, the worst pitch I've ever seen in my life. But um, no, it was a really good performance from Celtic yesterday, and I did think everything kind of looked compact. Bonnerig just played them in two weeks, actually. We go through to. Um, through to Air at Penny Car Stadium. So that will be interesting. I am really looking forward to that because... Who are you supporting? <laughs> Silence. So, I, I, um, won't, I won't make you answer that uh, live no, on the show. No, but I think obviously Bonnery played uh, Celtic on the first day of the season and everything was kind of like, what really actually is this? So the progression from the first day of the season to now is astronomical so I'm really looking forward to it in, um, in just a matter of weeks and I would urge any Celtic fan to, to really come along to it I think it was a little bit disappointing yesterday that the 500 obviously it's a 500 ticket right now that is it wasn't sold out I think there was still around 50 tickets mm. or something like that you know that's probably the disappointing bit for me and I know you guys touched on it yesterday so I won't go over it but um, f for me that I would urge any Celtic fan to get along to it because that's going to help everything as well. If you're looking at the fans investing in it and it's only going to urge the, the club in that to go forward. Before I come on to you Tony about um, new signings coming in 
uh, I'm going to have to ask you again, Amy, about the famous Bonerig pie. Uh, talk us, <laughs> talk us through it. I've never ate it. I'm not a pie lover. Um, I am the fussiest eater in the world. But um, yeah, the doner, it's a doner kebab pie, isn't it? Yeah. So it goes viral every now and again. And I don't really know why. I think it maybe must take for, I think maybe when groundhoppers come to come to the club, um, it kind of, it made match of the day a few weeks ago as well. But it's, um, it's, it's crazy to be honest. A doner yeah, kebab I'll, pie. I'll get Lawrence a tray. I think that's what we say. You need to. Yeah, you absolutely need to get Lawrence a tray. And um, what you can also do is get us a couple as well and we'll do a taste test for the tart and taste buds. Um, a- Amy has been talking about the youngsters coming in at Celtic, Tony, but of course the name on everybody's lips at the moment is Riley McGree, um, a player who um, is a playmaker, uh, we've spoken about having that type of player in the Celtic side. Um, he's obviously had a fair bit of experience having played in Australia and England and Belgium. Um, and he's currently playing his trade with Charlotte and the MLS. We all know about the viral goal, Scorpion goal that he scored, stinging the tail, all that stuff. Right. It's, it looks as though this is the perfect player for an Ange Postacoglu team though, Tony. And I know you'll have done all your research and watched all the show reels, but he looks like the type of player we're crying out for in the midfield. Which is why Ange is signing him, isn't it? He just looks like the prototype Ange player, as you've just said. And it's a name that hasn't been bandied about up until the weekend there, isn't it? So you know for a fact that the hand of Ange is all over these signs and you are now trusting the manager's judgment implicitly and more moreover and more importantly, the board seem to be seeming are seemingly judging the manager's you know, trusting the manager's judgment on it. So that's a good sign. You know, there's clearly conversations had about targets and players, who we can get, who we can't get, who's within the budget, who's within the range. And Riley McGree's names come up and Ange clearly wants them. And if you speak Speak to people, they'll tell you he's a wonderful footballer. Mm-hmm. Can play the eight, can play the ten, box to box, can score goals. Again, show reels are always impressive, aren't they? So, yeah, but proof will be in the pudding that if he does sign and you watch him with your own eyes and you make your own judgment. But he's another one that at this moment in time, I think he's getting a lot of Celtic supporters excited because of the show reel. Well, he is, and, and I think that. When uh, you look at the transfers so far, uh, there was a huge concern about the the lack of business or the speed in which we were doing transfers previously in time for the Champions League game to the point where we've gone into those games underprepared. We were throwing in an 18-year-old centre-half. It wasn't fair on him. Um, And we've come through to the January. I think that maybe I was being a wee bit optimistic because I've come into this season... And it's not being an entitled Celtic fan. I've come into this season thinking we need to win the league back. It's not that I expect us to win it back. We need to win the league back. And we know the reasons behind that. Um, And and a massive part of that uh, is the fact that, obviously, there's a huge uh, element of the, the, the funds going into the Champions League group stages. We know that. But a lot of people were trying to temper my enthusiasm. Kevin Graham was saying, you know, I don't think it's going to happen this season. It's going to take several transfer windows. Well, I'll tell you what, Amy, when you look at the business that we've done so far, and we'll talk about um, our Japanese boys who have come in, uh, but also some of the other names, Riley McGee, McGree, we're going to be talking about Jota, Cameron Carter-Vickers. I think Ange Postacoglu was in the same frame of mind as myself at the beginning of the season. He's going all out to win this title this season. That that is what I think the message is that's been sent out with this kind of uh, transfer business in January. Amy, what do you reckon? Yeah, it's it's rather unusual, but it's a welcome and unusual, isn't it? Um, <laughs> you know, to to have what day is it today? Is it the tenth, eleventh, something like that? And to have three in the door, well, four in the door, sorry, um, including Johnny Kenny, five on the brink. Um, it, it's crazy. This is unknown territory uncharted territory so it does send out a message it also in the flip sense it sends out the message that the board Michael Nicholson is fully you know behind Ange and can you blame him not at all he's investing in a manager who is obviously investing in his side he's he's bought into absolutely everything and I think Nicholson obviously does deserve a, a, a lot of credit a huge amount of credit for 
given Ange basically so far what would suggest all that he wants. Everything is, is going rather along rather smoothly. Mm. The cynic in me is a little bit worried that I'm like, this is a bit odd how well this is kind of does seem to be going. Um, but hopefully that'll that'll filter away at some point. But it's like you say, it sends that message, and it's a, it's a powerful message. It's um, a sign of strength, and it's just probably a bit of unity and a bit of co- cohesion, sorry, from the board to the manager to the players, something that's really been lacking. No, you're, you're spot on there. We've banged on about it before, the Holy Trinity, the fans, the, the board, the players and the management, and um, there has been a bit of uh, just disenchantment, I think, because we, we felt what's going on at the board level because, you know, Lowell's out, then Mackay comes in, Mackay's out, Nicholson comes in, he seems to be behind the scenes. But what he certainly is doing behind the scenes is he's doing a lot of work and he's getting these deals over the line. We'll come on to some of them in a moment, Amy, but I'm going to ask you about Riley, Riley McGree. Uh, Riley McGree, 23-year-old, I was reading some of the stuff that was going out on social media by the Birmingham City fans who basically wanted to kidnap him to stop him from leaving the country. That's how much they wanted to retain the player. Um, Obviously, Australian International, another one who's going to be part of the long-haul crew along with Roderick and our four Japanese boys. Does that give you any concern at all, Amy, or is it basically a case of, you know what, we'll deal with that with a depth of the squad, and it's worth dealing with that when you're getting that type of quality in? Yeah, I think it's it's a, it's one of those tomorrow issues, really. Um, I think you get the guys that your manager wants in the door, and you deal with these things that will inevitably come up, um, if, if that's the market that you're dipping into. But it's it's simply one of these things for me and it is, I understand that it is a, a big deal and when it comes to a matter of weeks and you'll ask me and I'll be missing them all, absolutely, but I think right now if the manager, if that's who he sees fit for his squad, then, then that's who you go for. Yeah, definitely. I'm just going to give a wee shout out to Kelvin who is behind the scenes here at State of Mind. Kelvin, could you put the link to the YouTube stream on the Facebook page, please? I've logged myself out and I can't speak and log myself in at the same time. Apologies. Uh, what about yourself, Tony? Uh, what's your thoughts on half a dozen players potentially being involved in long haul flights, etc.? And, and you know, it's caused a, a few problems in the past. I, I've got to say, I'm on Amy's boss at this moment because I'm thinking to myself, you know what, the quality outweighs some of these issues it might present in the future. Of course, it does. You, when was the last thing you got excited about Celtic signing players in January? You, you can't remember that, can you? That is very much uncharted territory. And the great thing is, people talk about Michael Nicholson. We've well, no heard from him, but he's doing business. Mm-hmm. That's the kind of board members you're. That's the kind of CEO you like. A silent partner who listens to the manager and gets deals done. That's the kind of person you like, you know. And I, I think uh, Nicholson's made a, a very decent start. You know, we'll worry about the players in international duty when the time comes. Mm. I'd rather they were in the door first, so we, so we have that dilemma. Yeah, yeah. Quality, quality footballers, as you say, you know my thoughts on these things, you cannot get enough good players in your football team. Because if you get good players in your football team, what are you? You're a good team. Yeah. I think the manager knows that as well. So he's signing decent players, or what he deems decent players that will fit into his system. So I'm all for that. And Michael Nichols does he say the word about these deals, has he? No. He's no. getting them done. He clearly trusts the manager, so there's clearly a line of communication there. That's all Celtic supporters have wanted all along. You know, and they are clearly going all out to do these deals. And, <coughs> excuse me, as you alluded to at the start there, send out a wee message. Mm. Celtic are saying, we're coming for this title. Man just clearly had a look and thought, this is doable. In Sta- the first- statement of intent, Tony. Yeah, statement of intent. He's clearly looking at it and thinking six points, not insurmountable, as I, I've been banging on about. It's retrievable. And so he's going to get a team that's going to be competitive for the rest of the season. And he's probably looking at thinking, can we win all the games until the rest, the end of the season? I think outwardly he would never admit that. Inwardly he would tell his players. Mm-hmm. You get a squad of players together and they get them to do what he wants them to do, then there's a fair chance that'll be the benchmark that he's trying to set. Might not be possible, but he's certainly setting a high bar. And I said if they brought the three Japanese players in, as well as Jota, 
and Carter Vickers in January, you would have accepted that, wouldn't you? It seems that they're now targeting more. You know, bringing in Riley McCree and possibly announcing Jota in the next few days. That's moved on as well. So you cannot be anything other than satisfied with the window and cannot be anything other than satisfied with the part that Nicholson's played so far and I'm just currently playing. Yeah. All round. I'm going to bring in some of the comments. Thanks, everybody, for getting involved. For some reason, we're not streaming on Facebook, but it's because I've logged myself out mm-hmm. uh, inadvertently. However, the, the comments that are coming in are all very positive, which is great, and I love a bit of positivity. Uh, I've seen on uh, Twitter a picture. Someone had mocked up the centenary signing picture, you know, the one with Billy McNeil kneeling down, and he's got Billy Stark and Andy Walker, etc., behind him, Chris Morris. And there was a few others that followed. So they've, they've thrown in a couple of experienced players, Tony, just to, to fill it out. Uh, I don't think I'll be happy until I see a, a picture like that with, um, you know, all our new signings flanking Ange Postacoglu. Uh, so well done anybody who photoshopped that Donny boy good afternoon thank you for getting involved in the show Brian Murphy also these uh, names are continually getting involved in the Axom chat so thank you very much uh, Ewan boy Martin who actually came on to the show a couple of weeks back and will be coming back on for a show Ewan because it went down in an absolute storm I've got to say so we'll get you in for a game um, and uh, yes, we did use the word honking, underwater cabbage salesman, but there was a link to a video we put out the other week there. We were doing the Celtic, the Axon retrospective, the Celtic collection volume one, and they were asking young kids outside Celtic Park, what do you think of the new away kit? And the young guy says, it's honking. And you know what? You couldn't really argue with that. Something that wasn't honking, of course, was the Scorpion kick. It was nominated, um, Rylan McGree's uh, Goal was nominated for the Puskas Award, which, and um, I'm just going to have a wee look at this, is to be awarded to the male or female judged to have scored the most aesthetically significant or most beautiful goal of the calendar year. So talking about beautiful aspects of football, we will move on to Jota. He's already been mentioned by Tony Haggerty. It's almost as if we're getting a double done with this one, right? So you sign him on loan and you get the the height and the positivity of that, Amy, then we sign up permanently in January and you get a double dose of, of the Jota. Um, again, I just think that it's one of these things in the past, we've maybe had a player in on loan and we might have started uh, the ball rolling on a permanent deal, but we haven't done it. And there's been a few, I mean, you know, opinions will, will fly about. I loved Jason Denier. I just don't think we ever made any efforts to keep him at the club. Um, why couldn't we keep him when we could keep a player like, uh, or bring a player like Boyata in from the same side, Man City? Uh, but we've not hung around with Cameron Carter, Vickers and Jota. And the word is that these guys will also be paraded, paraded as permanent signings. Um, and to be honest with you, if we get the, the three Japanese players that we've already signed in, R- Riley McGree, plus CCV and Jota on permanent deals. Would you be happy? I think I'd be happy with the business in, I've got to say, going into to February after this window. What's your thoughts, Amy? Yeah, I think any Celtic fan would be lying if they said that they weren't. Um, you know, to, uh, another touch that you, uh, another thing sorry, that you guys were touching on yesterday was probably Celtic's failure to really utilise loan deals well. Um, and I think this it would just be the, the perfect example of, of doing so correctly you know like you say the hype has been brought up by both of them I think in a lesser way to Carter Vickers but I think that's to his credit as a defender that you know the less you need to say about him the better although we are all so aware you know um, of his his stature and just his his presence in defence he's so powerful but I think the fact that he's not having to get mentioned week in week out or always having to be you know the the, the star man kind of thing shows all the the work that the rest of the side's doing but for for your time in particular um there's been a lot of branding of generational talents in, in this past week. Um, some some I disagree with, and some some I do agree with. And, and Yota's one of them. I can't. I, it's annoying me. I can't think of who I saw on Twitter, but he is. I think a guy I actually go to uni with picked him out in 2018 or something like that for one to watch across European leagues, and I read it, and it was a, it was amazing. It was in the same piece as Erlen Haaland. Um, it was a really really good piece. So that was even back then. But and mm. you look at now that kind of progress that he's made from, from 2018, I think it was 18, um, it's it's incredible. It'd be the perfect perfect player for Celtic. But going back to it, it's just utilising the loan system well in a way that we've probably not done in, in recent years. 
You're doing it better. I mean, there's been so many players come on on loan and you just know it's a stopgap, Tony. And I, I think that when you bring in a player at a certain age that fits a certain kind of model that we have had where you think that if you bring them in, you put them on a platform, not just in Scotland, but in, in Europe and our level at the moment is the third tier of European competition, but put them on a level that in two or three years, then obviously they will become an asset to the club. And, and he ticks all of these boxes. And I'm not thinking about the marketability of Jota or the sell on value at this moment in time, but he certainly is a player that, that not only is he going to come in and make an impact, but long term, he can benefit the club in that way as well. Tony, it, it says it, to me, it's a no brainer to bring in uh, Jota and Cameron Carter-Vickers, but it's not as simple as that. I mean, there's a fair bit of work being done behind the scenes to get these deals done and early. Yeah, it's, it's never as simple as that. Deals are never as straightforward as that. But the positivity emanating from the club that they're certainly trying to do these deals, you know, they would have waited to the very last day in the window and then come out with some statement that it, it wasn't possible. At least Celtic are trying to force this deal over the line. And the, and I think the only person that can throw a spanner in the work in this deal is Jota himself. Because this will all come down to whether the player wants to sign for Celtic or not. Because all the all the all the building blocks are in place. Mm. We have the option to buy, we have the price, we have gone to Benfica now seemingly and said we want to accelerate this deal and get it done this month. It will now come down to whether the player wants to do that, wants to commit his future to Celtic. But it is the ultimate no brainer because you know, you don't want to project too far ahead. You just want to see Jota playing for Celtic and enjoying them for as long as you have them. And, you know, and it is the ultimate no-brainer deal. And the player looks happy, the fans are happy with them, and he looks happy in, in Angie's system. You know, that, that goes a long way. I know he can earn a lot more money elsewhere by waiting to the end of the season. But see, when a player's happy in their environment, you know, he, he should have been happy in Benfica, but he wasn't. See, when you play with a place where you where you you are loved and he will be loved and he'll be loved by sixty thousand people every other week. You know, that's quite a powerful thing. And also the allure possibly of Champions League football. If Celtic won the title they're straight into the Champions League, that's a big, big stage for any player mm-hmm. to to perform and a, a massive platform to show people if they do think that they are worthy of bigger and better things, then Sign for Celtic, win is the title, take us into the Champions League and then go and show the world what you're all about and you will progress. We will not stand in your way, Jota. So commit yourself, you know, go, go down that route, go down that path mm-hmm. and it's a win-win for every party then, isn't it? All Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Some of the language that Ange uses, he's, he's talking about the players that come here are ambitious footballers. This is a platform for ambitious footballers. You look at a lot of the obvious kind of examples that we'll be using to sell to players that come in. You look at the development of some of these guys like Van Dijk is the obvious one. And, you know, you know Wanyama goes down, down south and Foster ends up in an England World Cup squad. But you also look at, you know, Boyata and Denaya playing for the number one ranked national team in the world. You know, and these guys, part of their development was at Celtic. So I think that there is a platform there for guys like Jota. And I'm not selling them before we've bought them. You know, I, I'm not looking too far ahead. But in terms of his development, I think there's a, there's elements of the Dembele about him, whereby Moussa Dembele comes to Celtic and it was the perfect move at that time for his career. And he knew, although he, he got at his feet near the end, he knew that he, he comes to Celtic for two or three seasons and he'll get his big move, which he's got. And he'll get another big move at some point, Moussa Dembele. But on the subject of loans, and I'm going to come back to yourself first uh, on this one, Amy, I don't think we've used them all that effectively in the past, in or out, I've got to say, because we've had players at our disposal that should have become permanent signings, and it's not happened. We've brought a whole swathe of, of loan players in who have disappeared, having not made much of a, a of an impact. Um, last January is an example with John Joe Kenny. Um, we've had you know players who have come in like Ollie Burke, uh, Scotland's most expensive footballer, Ollie Burke, came in. You knew it was never going to be a permanent deal. But also the players out. And we've spoken time and time again. Um, at this moment in time, we've got 10, 10 players out on loan. Three of them are out on loan to Scottish Premiership sides. 
And I want to see more of that because, yes, it could be fine margins, but if you are weakening your challengers, your main challengers, by giving um, loan deals to players within other clubs, within your league, be that Hibs, Dundee, Motherwell, any club, then, yeah, it could be fine margins, but a Henderson might do the damage. You know, I'm not going to say for, for a moment Griffiths is going to do the damage. We don't know what the future holds for Griffiths, but sure, a young striker might score that goal that gets a draw against your challengers. And I think that um, as well as getting guys out and giving them game time, like Robertson's going to come back with 75 games under his belt at the age of 20, and that game time's happened down south, and I get that. I just think that with that level of player, 10 players out, let's get as many of them as possible. Let's work around the clock to get them to premiership clubs, Amy. It makes total sense to me. Um, I think we spoke about it a few times on here. I like Shaw to Motherwell, um, not only because of the, the reasons that you kind of outlined and you think, right, well, if you can maybe play a part, you know, against uh, challengers or, or something like that, you just think, right, he's going to be training at a really decent level, really decent facilities in Scotland as well. Um, it's keeping them close, it's keeping them knowing the league, knowing the grounds. It's simple little things like that. I know a lot of people don't think that that plays a part, but, you know, you, Unless you've played Aberdeen at, you know, half seven on a Tuesday night, you don't really understand how cold that is. It's little things like that. Um, so for me, it is, it's the way to go. I would be more than happy for, for Celtic to do that. I'm a big fan of Scott Robertson and I look forward to when he comes back. But as you say, he's coming back with 75 or 70 caps, whatever, um, appearances under his belt, sorry. Um, but it's in a totally different division, a totally different standard, totally different style of play as well. Um, if you say, like say, just say he was at Motherwell, Motherwell, they, they do actually build. To be fair, when we played them, they were a little bit more expansive. But you're looking at sides who then play, who Celtic play against, they kind of sit in a little bit. So they would know, if they then played for Celtic, how the opposition face Celtic, yeah. how, how the preparation is all in it. Because um, they've been on the, the other side of the coin. So I don't understand why we've not done it more. Um, but it's, it's certainly something that, that I'm excited by, especially by Shaw going to, to Motherwell. I think it's a, it's a decent move for, for all parties. And I think that's the kind of thing that you're looking at the crucial fact that is it a good deal for all parties. It's keeping him close to Glasgow as well. It's all these little things um, that I, I would personally think would, would make the, the world a difference. Yeah, I mean, just touching on the Shaw, the Shaw deal, uh, one of our contributors to the state of Scottish football, Tony Jenner, um, who's a Motherwell fan, reckons that he's going to struggle to get game time there because they're pretty well covered. Uh, and I'm going to bring up a, a, a comment from Brian Murphy. Is Riley McGree any better? And I think you can also put uh, Liam Shaw in this category. Are they any better than some of the youth talents that we're, we're bringing through? Is he better than Liam Henderson, who scored a Serie A goal of the weekend? Sometimes I think we don't give a guys enough of a chance, but are prepared to spend money on outside projects. Well, I think that's been a topic of conversation a few times on Axon because I agree with it to a degree. I mean, the, the signings of Sean Urigidi, uh, the ages that they are, development-style signings that won't be playing for the development team, the B team. I find that those types of signings quite strange in many ways, uh, Tony, and that's probably why Shaw's getting loaned out. He's not going to get much game time or any game time for Celtic between now and the end of the season. But when you look at the players who have made successes of their Celtic careers after having gone out on loan, you know, it's happened in Scotland for the likes of Chris Sire and, and Ryan Christie. It's happened for um, Callum McGregor down in England. Are we getting the balance right? Can we do it better? Do we need to have a full-time loans manager like they do down south? I mean, Gary Caldwell was at Man City in that role prior to joining Maloney at Hibs. Yeah, I think you maybe have to start looking at something like that and taking it a lot more serious. You know, the, the likes of Shaw and Urigiri are not going to play, are they? You know that. And Ewan Henderson was let go to Hibs and... I, I say that on Friday, and, I, and I'll repeat it. I, I don't think it's any slight on these guys' ability. It's just that we are better players at the club, mm -hmm. and and just taking the club in a different direction, and knows the kind of players he wants to bring into the club as well. So I think and just got his eye on all of that as well, and he's going to utilise the loan system, especially with players going out, and to see what benefits them. There's no use sitting in the stands at Celtic. So go and play for Motherwell. Go and play for Aberdeen, Coman, or whoever it is. You know, in the likes of uh, Christie's case, it, it was Aberdeen, the Ayer, it was Coman. Look, you know, I know Coman are in the, the championship now. 
but they were playing in the league and they got used to every ground. As Amy said, they got used to every mm. every team in the league and then they could bring that knowledge back of how that team played against Celtic. So they knew they, it was just a great education for them and they came back better players. Not the finished article, but a better article than they that were when they left the door, the exit door, to go mm. out on loan. But they were all the better for it, and then they made a valid contribution. So if that's what's going to happen to Shaw, then go to Motherwell. And, and if he doesn't get game time, so be it. You know, that's that's the chance you take. But you're putting them out there, hopefully to get game time, to enhance and enrich their Scottish football experience so they come back and they can make a valid contribution. I think Andy's very aware of that. Well, time will tell if he made a mistake in letting Ewan Henderson go to Hibs. But again, you go back to the manager's judgment on this, don't you? You've got to trust it. Yeah, you've got to trust it, Tony. You know, and I think at this moment in time, he he just didn't see a future for Ewan Henderson at the football club. You know, so that, that, and that's that's the calls that managers are paid to make. Mm -hmm. So, and if he thinks he can bring in better players, by spending money, he will do it. But again, with value for money, and then if we can go right, rotate and then use guys in the loan system and put them out to other clubs, he will do it. So it wouldn't surprise me to see the likes of Uragidi going out. You know, and a lot of people are still talking about a centre half coming in or a centre back, or whatever you want to call it. I would be loath to give Welsh to Udinese at all. That's just a non starter for me. Because I think you need at least a rotation of four centre back. Hopefully, you're going to get Julian back to some kind of fitness and up to speed. So you would have Julian, Starfelt, Carter Vickers, and Welsh. I think rotating the four of them will be good for Celtic moving forward. So I wouldn't entertain the prospect of of uh, shipping out Welsh unless you're going to bring somebody in. Well. That that is the next kind of area, the the park that I want to talk about. And um, some people were quite surprised at the interest in Stephen Welsh. But you know, my Why? take on that, my my take on it, Tony, is I think Scottish products are uh, have got a high stock at the moment in Italian football. Um, so they're going to be looking at a player like Welsh, who has for two years now, for two seasons, been a a major part of the Celtic first team. They'll be looking at the successes of guys like Hickey and. At the aforementioned uh, Liam Henderson, and they'll be thinking, well, these guys can take the step up because Scottish Premiership to Serie A, I think we'll all agree, is a step up over the piece. But these guys can can make the step up. But I'm in the same of the same opinion as yourself, Tony. I don't think that just as Chris Julian comes back from his long term injury, we can afford to let someone like Stevie Welsh go. I'm just going to give a wee shout out to the old, or, Urban. Coolchie, um, afternoon, all my newfound Axon friends, my link to home. Love to hear that, actually. Well done. Brilliant to get involved. Um, so let's have a talk about the four guys then. First and foremost, we've been talking about Jota. And in the first half of that season, a lot of the kind of plaudits have been placed on the, the shoulders or at the feet of Jota and Kyogo. Maybe earlier on in the season, Abada was getting a bit of that as well, Amy. Uh, quietly effective, week in, week out, performances from Cameron Carter-Vickers have been absolutely solid. He's been a, a hugely influential player at the back, giving us a bit of the solidity that we lacked all season last year. And he's a massive factor, him and Hart behind him, in the fact that we've got the best domestic uh, defensive records. Um, so let's talk about him first and the necessity not only to get the flamboyancy Jota in the door, but to get that influence of Cameron Carter-Vickers in permanently as well. It's a, it's a must. Um, I think kind of what we're saying, just that discussion there a little bit about Welsh as well, I think it's be so crucial for, for Welsh to to have somebody like that who's got the experience. And I know you can't really say, you know, Carter Vickers, um, he, he, he was a bit unfortunate down south, didn't really hit the ground running as much as probably was expected of him. But the, 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 the learnings that he had at Spurs as a youngster, you know, came through, he broke through years ago now, actually. Um, but for Celtic, it's, he's... He's a necessity. You know, yeah. you're looking over the years, Celtic have chronically struggled for a, a decent centre half and for one to have, you know, there's obviously Virgil van Dijk, but he wasn't here for for that long. Um, and then you've had 
you, you speak about denier, didn't really keep a hold of him. Bayata wanted out the door. It's always been Celtic need a centre half, Celtic need a centre half. Um, and to be honest, it's probably been the the necessity for most clubs because there just seems to be that lack of you know big defender who just wants to defend, don't always want to play, but as much as Carter Vickers can, you just need somebody who's going to stop the ball from going in the back of the net. And I feel that's what Carter Vickers does, um, as well as everything else he, he brings with him. So it is a necessity to keep him. Um, and just basically, kind of to reiterate what you are saying, there is no way that, that Stephen Welsh can go out on, on loan to, to Indonesia. And I'm not shocked, I know... Um, some like you say on, on Twitter, there's been some surprise that they've even came in for him. I'm not surprised at all, but you can't afford to let him go because you're just staying in that same kind of position right now. You're saying that we are kind of light in, in the centre back department. Say if Starfield or Carter Vickers picks up an injury, then we're struggling. Mm. If Julian comes back and Wales goes out the door, you're just still in that same predicament that you're still in search of one. I think as well the fact that he's an academy player, you keep him, you keep these guys coming through. We're talking about pathways earlier with the Colts, um, or with the B side, sorry. Welsh is the perfect example of that. So for me, he has to stay. And I do think he has a big future at Celtic still and can play such a crucial part. And I think he's probably been unfortunate this season to not have more minutes than, than what he has. Mm-hmm. Um, but getting Carter Vickers on board, I just think it would offer something that Celtic have missed for, for so many years now. Yeah, and I think when you're looking at uh, Chris Julian coming back as well, I'm not going to use the cliche. I'm not going to say it, right? But but Julian is coming back in. We've seen him training. He's been out for over a year, uh, Tony. I can't for a moment take for granted that he's just going to slot back into the same performances that we were getting prior to his injury. But for me, when I look at those four, and I do rate Welsh highly, and I don't want him to go anywhere, I still view Julian and Carter Vickers as being the two first choices. But I'm doing that on an individual level because I've never seen the two of them play together. So yeah. when it comes back and how do we manage them back into the side? Because I remember when we signed them and most of us were, were quite surprised that he didn't go straight into the European game. Um, and and Bolongoli was also on the bench that night and we had £10 million of new signing on the bench and we played Callum McGregor at left back, bizarrely enough. How do we manage them back in? Slowly. We manage them back in slowly. And because it's a serious injury the man's coming back from. You have to get them match fit first and foremost. There's difference between being fit and being match fit. So, and we have to monitor that very, very closely. I'm sure the manager will know that himself. So, I'm not, not telling him anything that he doesn't know already. Mm-hmm. But I think in an ideal world, Celtic supporters want Julian and Cameron Carter Vickers to be their central defensive pairing. But that's not to say that Welsh and Starfelt are not able deputies if they have to come in and play a part and just looking for two good players for every position, isn't he? So I think that's a great pool of defenders. I just don't want Welsh to go anywhere because you saw earlier on in the season the state Celtic get into with with uh, injuries to midfielders and injuries to forward players. And as Amy says there, you let Welsh go out the door, you're running that risk again. Mm. Especially with someone like Julian who's still on the rehabilitation track, you know, so you have to be mindful of that. Yeah. If anything else, I think this is your chance to really endorse what Stephen Welsh has done and say, you're going nowhere. We'll throw any kind of bid out, unless it's stupid money. You know, every player has a price, but they need to offer a ridiculous sum of money to, to move Welsh. You know, there's people saying sell Welsh, bring in John Suter, things like that. You know, Suter's another one who's a very good defender, is having a wonderful season, but he's track record of injuries, you know, you'd be mindful of that, but I think Suter's a wonderful player, but, you know, why, why part with Welsh? He's his whole future ahead of him. You know, I, I mean, hopefully at Celtic. Yeah, but the point you make, I think we can link it into Brian's uh, comment earlier, where he's talking about us going for all these projects, why not stick with the guy you've got there? And the question is, is Suter any better than Welsh? And, and to be honest with you, when you look at the performances, and obviously Alan Morrison, who will be joining us later on this week, can give us stats and figures. But, you know, generally, from a football observer's perspective, Amy, I don't think he is any better. 
I really don't. And there's going to be people out there, you know, maybe scoffing at that. But I just do think that there's sometimes a perception of players that we've reared through not being to the standard. Then, you know, then we, we go to, to Hibs and we, we try and buy a player for £3 million. Are they any better? Is Suter any better than Welsh? I don't think he is. I really like Suter, I do. Um, I think he obviously came through at that really unbelievable just kind of free flowing Dundee United system and um, that side under under Jackie McNamara and it was just a really young great side to watch um, but I think I do think he is a better player than Welsh but he Welsh is so risk less risk free um, you know the suitors injuries are just as Tony said every single season mm. he's been plagued by injuries you know it's yeah. six months out and then it's two days back at training and then it's a year out and um, this is one of his longest runs for, for for a long time actually and I do really like him and I like to see him doing well um and I, and I do think he will get a big money move somewhere mm. he'll certainly get a move somewhere and I think it will happen this season um he could be missing the boat out on him but I just think he does come with so many problems. I think Suter is much better in the air than Welsh. Just kind of obviously I've said that I think Suter's a better player. I think Welsh struggles in the air. I think his physique Suter just is a little bit sturdier, a little bit stronger. Um but I've still got no problem in, in keeping Stephen Welsh at all. But if you asked me would you sign Suter tomorrow, of course I would say yes. Even when he nipped Kyogo the way he did Amy. <laughs> He, he my, my, style, view, my view, my view, and of them changed at that very moment. I'm just talking again about match fitness, and we've asked time and time again. We've asked ex players, Tony, what is it? What's match fitness? And I was in here the other night, last week, I think it was one night. Um, every day, kind of blends into one here in the studio. And Man United were playing in the in the background, and I'm not a massive viewer of English football. I used to be back in the day, but they're playing, uh, and the commentary team continually went on about Phil Jones coming back for his first game in two years. Did he look match fit? Yes. One of the best players on the park. So I'm mm-hmm. not quite sure what this match fitness is and how can you attain it without games? You know, this is the thing yeah. that I'm worried worried about a wee bit because we've got two guys in the squad who have broken down after long-term injuries and in Mikey Johnston and James Forrest. So we have seen it and we just don't want the same thing to happen to Chris Julian. So absolutely under no circumstances are we selling Stephen Welsh in this window. Mm-hmm. You know, that that's a massive no-no as far as I'm concerned. But there is another question uh, if we move forward. In fact, before we move forward, but we've not really spoken about Starfelt. Where does it leave Starfelt then? Because he's come in under difficult circumstances. He was thrown in at Tynecastle. How could you expect him to, without really knowing his teammates, just slot in and give us a performance? I thought he came into a game... There's people still got doubts about him. Um, his mistakes seem to be magnified. Uh, he's under the microscope a lot. Um, I did think he was developing a good partnership with Cameron Carter-Vickers. But where is he? Is he still very much for yourself, Tony, um, kind of seconds in the pecking order behind your Carter-Vickers and Julian? He would be, given an equal world, an ideal world, if Julian can prove his fitness, mm. he would still be... Julian and Cameron Carterwick will still be my ideal pair. And, you know, there's a player in Starfelt, but you talk about mistakes being magnified. Celtic were tuning all up and cruising against a very poor St. Johnston team. And Carol Starfelt took a brainstorm and passed the ball to a guy. The ball was put down the channel and St. Johnston pulled a goal back out of nothing. And a game where they were, it was 2 0 going on 5 6. And for a moment, you know, I think there was 15 minutes to go, eh, or 10 minutes, whatever it was. You know, for a minute you were like, you know, that could prove costly. Yeah. You know, it's that lack of concentration that, you know, that staff felt in games, you know, and, I, and, I, and I'm saying that there is a player there, but you have to be fully focused and concentrated for 90. You can't switch off every now and again. You can see goals and think, ah, you know, Ah well, it's okay. We'll we'll sort it out. You know that 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 could have been a problematic game for Celtic because of the team they had out that day. But they they made light work of it. But when that goal went and don't tell me any Celtic supporter went, oh no, and it on it all became because of a slack pass, mm. a momentary lapse. You know it didn't cost them in the end up, but it cost them a goal at that moment in time. You know and you were lucky you had the two goal cushion. You know, because the Celtic had played really, really well up to that point. It's just things like that we start felt. 
you know, you know my thoughts about the the, the Jordan White incident. You know, so I had my say on that. People strongly and vehemently disagreed with me on that. That's fine. But I, I just think that a fit Julian, a firing in all cylinders, firing in all cylinders, Julian displaces them from that team. And Julian and Cameron Carter Vickers are your pairing, and Welsh and Starfield are your backups. Yeah. That That's, to me, what I see moving forward. And if you want to be sure, to be sure, then maybe you do sign another centre-back and possibly Suter is worth the risk because you can get him for nothing, can't you? Uh, you have a contract or a pre-contract. And if you really are want to bolt it and say, right, do you know what? I quite like the look of him. Then he's the kind of player that you might take a risk on or a gamble on because you are getting him for or signing him on a pre-contract. Because I admire Suter, I think he's good. But by all means, he's forced his way back into the Scotland squad, but he's not doing anything that I don't think Welsh can aspire to and be a similar type player. Mm. No, and Amy was talking about his heading ability and stuff. Get all that, but I think players can work in their deficiencies. I think Andy's pretty good at that because he clearly spends time with players. So he'll be drilling it into them what they need to work on. Did it with Tony Ralston, didn't he? So I, I think you can do the same with Stephen Welsh. And as Amy's pointed out, a couple of deficiencies in Welsh's game. These are things you can work on as a defender, make yourself better. And who's to say in the fullness of time that Welsh will not be pushing for a place in the Scotland squad? Because I think he's he's a talented boy and needs to stay at the club. Yeah. I, I think so, and if he does, and I hope he does, I think um, the board will be looking at the squad and saying, well, we've also got Scales, who, by his own admission, is a centre-half, uh, who can play left-back and left-wing. But, you know, you have got the cover there. Um, and I think he's done really well. But again, talking about baptisms of fire and having to be switched on for 90 or 97 minutes, Tony, you know, Scales is a great example. He sets up the goal against Rolls County, but then he sells the jerseys because yeah. there's a momentary lapse of concentration. Um, it's good to see Jungle lying back in amongst the comments. This is exactly why managers should sign players, not men in boardrooms. I 100% agree with this. Um, and I've got a bit of a concern around the, uh, the, the, the signing, the long-term contract dished out to Conor Hazard but with, with regards to that because I think there was far too much interference from non-football department people around about the time at that club. And that, I think, Amy, um, has been removed since Andrew's come in. There's been a few legacy signings, absolutely, signings that were already down the line. You're not telling me that Andrew had anything to do with Sean Uruguidi coming into the club. People have doubts that he had anything to do with McCarthy coming in. Um, I guess we'll never know for sure, but there, there's definitely going to be legacy signings there. But in time, Andrew has definitely now stamped his authority on the, the football department. We're not seeing signings from kind of boardroom level, are we? No, not thus far anyway. I, I definitely think that there is a a, a sea change occurring right now. Um, certainly in the early stages of this window as well, you wouldn't you would say that every single one is um, an Ange signing. Um, f- for me, you're, you're looking, you know, uh, along the banner there. It's it's where we want them. It's where we want our manager to be dipping into because it's the markets that he knows so well, um, and that's why you do have to have total trust. Every signing that he's made so far, I don't think any Celtic fan could say that you know it's not one that we want, um, or that it's at least helping the squad. Perhaps not always helping exactly the first team, but it's helping the squad, and that's what he's here to do: build a decent squad. He speaks so often about how light a squad he inherited. We all know that. Um, so he did have a massive rebuild, and it is still taking place in this January. Of course, it is, and it'll probably still be taking place in the summer. It's um, f- it's. It is a change, and you can just feel it in the air. You can. What, what's your, your take on it, Tony? I mean, there's an inference uh, about a lot of things that go on at a football club, unless you're behind the curtain, you don't know for sure. But there does seem to be a change in approach, and it does seem to be far more let the football guys do the football business here. I just, you just said it was out of my mouth. I think Michael Nicholson's clearly of that opinion. Mm-hmm. You know, he's a CEO. He's a CEO for a reason. He's not the manager, is he? So I, and I banged on about it for a while uh, when we used to talk about the likes of Peter Law and stuff. You know, players have positions for a reason, natural positions. You know, people involved at football clubs have a natural role for a reason. So if Michael Nickerson's one of these guys 
I'll let Ange Postacoglu deal with the football side of things then I'm all for that mm-hmm. I'll deal with the finance I'll deal with the deals and I'll try and get them all right and I'll try and help the football man as much as possible because that's his area of expertise if he comes to me and says he wants this particular player if he represents value for money we can afford it and it it ticks you know, the financial boxes then so be it but there's going to have to be crossover there's going to have to be dialogue as long as one isn't impinging on the other too much, you know, football players are scouted by managers, aren't they? And football people, it's, they they know the they know that business. That's why they're football managers. So I don't, I, as I say, I, I think Michael Nicholson's got off to a cracking start. Uh, and I think it was uh, Jim that said the only time you really want to hear them is when they're talking about the figures, you know, at the beginning of the year or whenever, you know, and, and at the AGM. And see if that's what Michael Nicholson does, I'll be really happy with that. Because then I'll know he's letting the football man run the football side of the operations and he's trying to aid him and abet him as much as he can. Because you can see that by the fact that they're trying to sign players and try to conclude deals. That's all you want. You want Michael Nicholson to stay in the background, be silent until such times where he has to speak to comment on financial reports, figures, and at the AGM. Oh, non-football matters, you know. And and the big thing, how how much has Ange taken the heat off this board, Amy? I mean, I'm not turning this... uh, this particular show, uh, you know, an anti-board show, there's nine minutes to go, but he hasn't half taken the heat off the board, eh? Everyone's just talking about the football. Um, Mm -hmm. And... I think the, the board, there'll be plenty of guys in there that'll be absolutely delighted with that. That You see, the attention is off them. But as a fan, and it is, it's so important, obviously, to to call the board out when things aren't going right, as last season. But if you ask any Celtic fan, what do they want to be talking about? You want to be talking about the football. Well, I certainly do anyway. Um, that's what you want to be coming on a podcast and speaking for an hour for, or speaking, you know, in in the pub. That's that is what matters. That's you, you fall in love with the the club and the the playing side of things and the football, not you know who's who's running it, but when it's not being run well, because you love the club, you have to you know you have to call it out basically and and speak off it. But right now, the fact that this season has been so heavily focused upon the football, I think it's a really pleasant change, and especially in the climate that we're in, you know, over these last few weeks when there's been no football um, at the at the highest level. Sorry, it's it's shown how much we've, we've fell in love um, this season with with Angie's play as football, the players, because it's been missed so so dearly. Mm, ah, definitely. Now, uh, sorry, Tony. Then you come. And it's also what we've spoken about, despite the fact there's no, there's been no football. We mm. haven't had a go at the board or a season going awry and various things. We've spoken about football matters. We've spoken about players coming in. We've spoken about how well the team are playing. We've spoken about how well the manager settled. It's all been really positive. We've spoken about winning the first trophy. We've spoken about we can win the league. These are all football matters. Whereas last season, the wheels were coming off the bar a big time at this point. And it was all non-football issues we were talking about. Dubai, the board, the manager. You know, we weren't focusing on things that were happening on the field, which as Amy said there, we have been Mm -hmm. talking about things that have been happening on the field all season. Now the board possibly have got lucky and they've won a watch with Ange coming in taking the heat off them, that's fine. And we will turn our ire to them if things aren't being run the way we will call it out always. But, yeah. you know, you're not having to speak about the board because the manager and the players are doing what you expect of a Celtic team to be highly competitive, to play a brand of football that you're enjoying. And, you know, and within six months, I think a lot of people say it, and just giving you your pride back in your football team, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's which had disappeared by the end of of last season. You were disgusted with a lot of stuff, and you you wondered what Andrew was going to do to turn it around. You worried for him, and the initial scepticism wasn't so much about Andrew; it was about what he had inherited and what he was working with upstairs. Nothing to do with Andy's ability. We all knew he was a talented manager because he's the most successful manager in Asia, having won trophies in Japan, Australia and with the Australian national team. It wasn't about Ange per se, it was about the people 
that he was working with and the people that had brought the club to basically its knees last season and then said to him, can you resurrect this? And this man has came fly, flown, what, 5,000 miles across the world and said, yep, I'm the man to do this. An unflinching belief in his own ability. Yeah. I'm going mm-hmm. to do it my way. And that's what Celtic needed at this moment in time. Being a kind of a successful marriage. Celtic needed a manager like that who said, I'm going to do it my way. Um, and I believe in what I'm doing. And he got everybody on board. And to do that within six months, and I've said it before, it's it's bordering on pretty miraculous because there were so many split factions amongst players, management. Tony, he's done, he, you know, he's he's done it by saying, you know, I'm going to do this, and I'll do I'll do it with Tony Ralston at right back, right, and I'm going to do it with near Beaton playing there in midfield, and then he's doing it with what he had to to deal with, and now he's getting the opportunity to mould the team and yeah. his kind of vision. And there's a couple of comments coming in saying that you know the way this is going, we might well be prepared, the best shape that we've been in for a long time, moving into the court, the the Champions League next season if we win the league, because that has been a big criticism, isn't it? We're yeah. just never ready. We've never got the guys in on time. We've not got the team in uh, in good shape. We're always selling players off in the summer, not replacing them in time. Uh, and I think that that is where the signs are are, are kind of heading. That we not only are we trying to win our title back, but we're actually being prepared for the first time in in many many years for the European endeavours, wherever they may be, uh, whichever tournament they may be in for next season. I'm bringing this up because it's on Twitch. Snick67, Michael Nicholson's coming out this window looking good so far. Feels nice to be, not to be moaning about a board for a change. Snick, as Tony says, if uh, the you know the chance arises during the season and we need to call them out, then we will do. But not just for the sake of it. Um, for some reason, well, I know the reason, I logged myself out of Facebook. We're not streaming live on Facebook, but Kelvin has put a link up on the Facebook. So if you've had to come through the YouTube channel, you're normally watching Facebook. Apologies, it's all my fault. Um, now, there's another thing that maybe went under the radar a wee bit uh, because obviously Julien's back and uh, our new signings from Japan are training in the snow. But Yakamakis returned to training as well. Now, here's a guy that's almost forgotten about Amy. And, you know, I wouldn't put it past, I wouldn't put it past Ange Postacoglu to get a player out of him. He's obviously been signed for a reason, but I've not seen it because of injury. It took him a while to get this match, this fabled match fitness. It took him a wee while to get to that stage. He then comes in and gets injured. Is he going to be a guy that's going to be very useful to Ange in the second half of this season as well, Amy? You'd certainly like to hope so. Um, as you say, Ange brought him in, obviously saw that he could be useful in some kind of aspect. It certainly offers a totally different dimension. Um, you know, you, you look at his physique, uh, his kind of fleeting appearances for Celtic. He he can drift out wide as well, although I do think he's much better being that target man. Um, but that's basically him in a nutshell. You know, it, he offers being the target man. Kyogo does so, so much, but he's not the big six foot powerful, you know, he's going to rustle and bustle with defenders, we're talking like guys like John Suter, you're thinking Yakumakis is going to equally, you know, give it back um, or, or so you hope for that kind of different dimension, so you hope that he can play a big part, you hope that he gets back to, uh, uh, like you say, uh, some kind of match fitness, whatever that may be to be able to play a part but if he's been he's been signed for a reason you know, lots has been discussed and dissected about his stats last season um, but yeah, you, you you have to live in the hope that he can get back to that elusive um, match fitness and, and play that crucial part as as the running comes along. Yeah, he's one of these guys that you know we we've seen fleeting appearances often, particularly in Europe. And you're you're looking at the strength, the way he was holding up the play, and you thought he could be a handy player. Then a couple of bad performances, and he's in that category, Tony. Of you know we might have signed a dud. So. I'm on the fence with Yakima because I've not seen enough of him, but he's in the building. He'll be ahead of a Yeti, I guess, in the pecking order, um, basically on the basis that we've brought him in within the last six months, but we've not really seen him. So once we get him up to that match fitness um, and you look at the amount of crosses that come in, I'm not going to make my comparison again because I'm getting slagged off for it in the comments. The amount of crosses coming in for Jota, he could well be the guy at the end of this. And then you add into that the fact that we've got Maeda 
now as an option, and I think he will be the first option up top because he's the guy that Ange knows, and many were surprised in Japanese football that he didn't go for him before Kyogo. So where does it leave Yakamakis if we can get him fit? Remember, we're still fighting on three fronts. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you've got the League of Scottish Cup and the Conference League. Very much a squad game. They should, rename, they should rename that Conference League, don't you think? Yeah, yeah they should. But they definitely should. Do. Yep. Uh, and, uh, you know, so Yakimakis will have a part to play. He's got to prove that he's worthy of playing a part. And in small parts, he has looked okay. I think everybody's jury's out. But he made a road for his own back by that lackadaisical penalty miss against Livingston. And everybody formed kind of judgments on that. But the same the same people that formed the judgment when he came on against Leverkusen and Ferenc Farris was holding the ball up, was playing guys in, looked hungry. You know, so uh, you know he you know he made it hard for himself by the the way he opted to take that penalty and and miss it. Mm. Well, a, a confident striker runs up and rams it in. But I don't want to dwell on it too much, but it did cost Celtic a vital two points in the championship title race. Sorry, in the league race so far, but he, you know, so if, if he buries that, he would have been a hero. You know, things could have been very different for him, and then he gets injured again. And it's like, oh, and I, I never use words like dud to describe a player that's played for Celtic. I can never say that by virtue of the fact that you've played for Celtic, you've got ability. I include that with everybody. You never call people duds, you, you can call them, you know, poor. Or, or maybe not up to the standard you expect of a Celtic player, but can he call? Can he label them duds? And I think he will have a part to play because Andrew want him to play a part. He'll need him to play a part. But I, I like you. I think Maeda will be that guy that will go up top. But see if anything, see if you're Yakimakis, surely in the second half of the season you're going to say you've not seen the real Yakimakis yet. I'm going to show you. I'm going to show the fans. I'm going to show the manager. I'm going to show everybody. Well, you know, the real the cliche, will the real Jack and Marcus please stand up? Well, we're hoping he stands up the second part of the season. You see if he does, again, that's a win win. Another got, option. Another Absolutely. Option up front, so yeah. I hope he does. I hope so as well. And, and I think, you know, I've been kind of hoping that McCarthy does as well, but we've not quite seen it yet. I've seen a couple of glimmers of the old McCarthy Michael McDonald guilty yeah I did use my Janola Ferdinand reference although I didn't use him by name Michael but it does count as a reference absolutely there's also been uh, mentions in here of the fact that Leo Held uh, played 70 minutes yesterday for Leeds United started the game FA Cup against West Ham um, and we, would, we spoke about it yesterday and we'll talk about it in more depth the amount of young guys that are leaving Celtic and making a, a right good uh, career for themselves elsewhere having never played for the club and that's the frustration he would never played a first team game for Celtic um, yeah we don't like to call anybody a dud but I really used to love Tony not the fuse they embarrassed the hoops because <laughs> some some players did I mean some players did embarrass yeah, of hoops. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's, that's fair enough. And it was, but that a was tongue in cheek, a tongue in cheek uh, feature, wasn't it? Absolutely. Yeah, you've, heard, you've heard me uh, reference Jim Melrose a few times, you know, so that that kind of thing. I would never yeah. call him my dad. He played for Celtic, but he did. You know, he he did. The, the embarrassed the hoops, uh, tongue in cheek kind of category. Uh, thanks. You get away with nothing on this this show, do you, Martin Bickett? <laughs> reminding me, do you know the Claxon. Uh, yeah, you're right. But Jim Melrose did play a massive part in bringing Gary Hooper to Celtic because he was uh, obviously Neil Lennon's go-to guy at that time. He was Neil's agent. He was doing a bit of the scouting and he was massively involved in the, the Hooper deal as he well. Can, so he can claim an assist, which is probably more than he got <laughs> when he was in a Celtic jersey. So we'll forgive him. We certainly will. Yeah. It's been a very, very quick hour on the Monday Bulletin. Thanks, everybody, for getting involved. Apologies again if you've had to switch from Facebook to YouTube to watch us. That was my fault. We'll sort it ASAP. Uh, all that's left for me to say thank you again, Amy Canavan and Tony Haggerty for joining me on a Celtic State of Mind. 